everyone. Welcome to another Fiat Group Empowering Plans webinar. I'm your host, Adam Russo. With me, as always, is Ron Peck. Say hello, Ron. Hello, Ron. And now, Ron, you know, it's almost like we have to have these two additional people every single time we do a webinar. Brady Bizarro is no longer just, you know, a, a, a I would say, once in a while guest. He's become a feature part of our show that people... He has a lot of fans out there. He gets a lot of love, you know, love letters in the mail. He puts the social in social media. That's right. And uh, then Jim McCormick is a staple, a fan favorite. So it used to be that Ron and I could do these things by ourselves, but I think we're just getting less and less popular, Ron. Well, Jen puts the me in social media. That's it. <laughs> so, again, thank you, Jen. Thank you, Brady. And thank you to the hundreds of you that are that have dialed in on today's webinar. We're excited to talk about... Today is plan on saving by saving your plan. Haha, that's a good one, Ron. Not Ron, exactly. just so you know, for those of you who wonder who comes up with these titles, it's typically Ron. This is what he does all day. He doesn't really have a job anymore other than coming up with titles <laughs> for webinars and podcasts and so forth. Speaking of podcasts, we used to do our podcasts once every two weeks. We've been told by many people that they enjoy them. So not only are we going to increase those to like once a week, we're actually looking at technology now that we can actually have special guests. So if you're someone out there in the audience right now listening and you think you'd be a great guest for the Empowering Plans podcast, let us know. We'll probably ignore you because Ron and I don't actually want any guests. Yeah. But we don't want to share the microphone with anybody. Well, I'm looking for a <laughs> modest guest. So if you want to nominate yourself for the Modesty Award, I think you might be the only one in the running. So. Right. In addition to talking about lessons learned to create the perfect plan, we're going to have a quick demo uh, at the end as well. We're going to talk about a lot of the latest stuff that's out there. I think today is pretty interesting because we saw with Berkshire Hathaway, we saw with Amazon and J.P. Morgan now combining efforts to create this new innovative health plan. Last I heard, they haven't called us yet. Have you guys gotten a call from these guys asking, uh, from Amazon I, asking for free? Adam, yeah. Adam, I was actually going to talk to you about that off the air, but, uh, you know. <laughs> Right. It's a, we think it's a maybe, you know, we haven't talked about it exclusively yet. I'd like to get your feedback on what you guys think. Sure. I think it's a potentially great thing for the industry, but it's also potentially a bad thing. You can look at it either way, but I guess, you know, having the best technology firms, you know, some of the leading companies in the industry looking at, in the country, looking at ways to innovate in healthcare. Right. It's probably a, a good step for us. Who said we didn't have enough to do a weekly podcast? You kidding me? <laughs> I guess we do. So these are the speakers today. As you can see, none of us look as good today as we do on the screen. <laughs> Just want to make sure everyone's aware. We got a little snow here in Boston, so everyone is wearing their snow attire, which for Ron is basically the same clothes he always wears. Um, but everyone else does not look as good as they do on that screen. Feel free to follow us on LinkedIn as well. We have thousands of followers. That's where you can get the latest information on our offerings, on stuff that we're seeing in the industry, just some of the uh, goodwill issues, some of the pain points that we're seeing across the country, whether it's stop loss issues or just ridiculous overcharges from facilities as well. In addition, as you all know, this webinar, the one that you're on right now, was named one of the top-ranked healthcare webinars in 2017. We thank you, our listening audience, for making that happen. We expect the same to happen in 2018. Oh, we got a couple of good uh, – already got some comments up there from some of our listeners. Speaking of love letters, one of the people that died out that, that sent us a comment is someone that literally has been on our webinars since we started the run. I think and they I, were listening before we were even doing them. They were waiting for us to they start. They were waiting for us to start. No question. What we're going to talk about today, problem, purpose, process. You're going to know what that means in a second. Political update, we all know who's going to give us that. That's going to be Brady. Our consulting FAQ, one of the most frequently asked questions that we received this month – Jen McCormick will share that with us. We're going to talk about our flagship template. We're going to talk about some of the best practices out there. We're going to give you some examples of things that are no longer in the template. We took away some of the options. And last but not least, some before and after photos. I'm not talking about the Botox treatment that any of us have received recently. We're just going to have some before and after photos and screenshots before flagship and post flagship. Now, if you think I'm flying through this, you're right. There's a lot to go through. But what is this? So as many of you as many of you know, our industry is old. Uh, what I mean by that is there aren't a lot of young people that are really incentivized to want to get involved in self-funding or in health insurance. Let's be honest, it's a taboo term. So what we have done, as many of you know, I am on the board of directors at SIA. I was lucky enough to be named the chairman of the board for 2019, so I am the chairman-elect for this year. 
And my big initiative is to get young professionals, millennials, involved in our industry. So recently, and Brady, you can attest to this, recently I think about 20 young professionals from different companies across our country met in Dallas and basically brainstormed because this year at the national event SIA conference in October, we will have a young professionals track where every company out in our industry is encouraged to send one or two people to the national conference to get these young professionals inspired to love not only to love self-funding and to have a passion for it the way we do. Brady, anything you want to add in regards to what you guys went through this week in, at, uh, in Texas? Just want to say that we had a lot of good ideas and feedback from everyone there and um, be very excited about the plans we have from a more expanded social media presence to basically, like Adam mentioned, this young professionals track, which I think will be very popular. And so as the months go by, we'll be putting in place many of our ideas. So if you're interested in learning more or thinking about sending some of your people to this event, please feel free to email me directly, arusso at feedgroup.com. If you don't have my contact info by now, shame on you. So what was the purpose of this? What we realized by talking to our young team here, and we got over, I would say, 100 people under the age of 35. We met with them. We surveyed them. Jen, you're not one of those people. <laughs> we met with them. We searched. She's like looking at herself like, yes, that's me. <laughs> we met with them. And what we found out was many people just didn't know what it is that we even do. Well, you know, they know that we do subrogation, plan drafting, but one of the key elements is why do we do what we do? So we actually call this bringing it back to basics. And myself, Ron, Matt, our social media director, sat down and we figured out what is the problem and what is our purpose? Our purpose as a company is to make health benefits affordable for employers and employees. Why? Because every hardworking American deserves affordable health care. How do we do this? By empowering plans. And what does that mean? Customize. Control your plan design, which we're going to talk about today, and we do that by promoting and educating self-funding, implementing cost containment services, and delivering solutions. We're using this, folks, as a way to attract new employees. We're using this as a way to attract new clients, and we would urge many of you out there to do the same because what we've noticed is the number of applicants we receive since we changed our focus to these particular points, problem, purpose, process, has really changed the interest level in this organization and I would call the, the passion that some of these young people have and want it to be with our organization. Yeah, well, Adam, Adam, if I may also, hopefully people have noticed as they look at the slides, they see the terms that are highlighted. One of the things that I think we're trying to do when it comes to messaging is to stay positive. And you'll find in our industry, a lot of the terminology we use, cost containment, uh, rising cost, insurance, it's just, even though cost containment is a good thing, cost, contain, these are words with negative connotation. Our attitude is that people need to see this as a benefit. The fact that they call it a benefit plan, once upon a time, people didn't see it as a, as a right. They saw it as a privilege. And what we as industry members and employers can do to return the benefit to benefit plan, staying positive, how we communicate to the general public because again without the support of employers and employees and the general populace we're not really going to see things go our way uh, and as we talk about legislation in the past and Brady's going to go into politics you'll see that it is important what the public view is on us not just internally as an industry. Now I, again we've had a lot of different comments already up there one of the things I want people to be aware of is in our industry obviously there's HCA and SPBA. HCA has a great emerging leaders program that also caters to the same type of uh, the, the same type of clientele and same type of employees out there. I would say the key difference is obviously SIA, a lot of people at SIA don't follow this type of approach. So we're trying to engage them and also in respect to not necessarily being leaders, but just identifying people that have an interest in changing the game and changing the way healthcare is delivered and paid for in this country. So a lot of the belief systems that we're trying to incorporate are less about the basics of, basics of self-funding or self-funding 101, which I believe is that, you know, which I believe is the GED level of, of self-funding. What we're trying to do at SIA is more of a health Rosetta, Dave Chase type of approach, where we're trying to change the way we look at paying for health care, processing claims, and just looking at health insurance in a different way, more of a risk factor or risk taker versus a boring insurance company. But that's enough of that. So we're going to turn it over to Brady. I think it's interesting. Tonight is the State of the Union address. Um, and we're going to talk about deflating Obamacare. As many of you know out there, you know, 
this is going to affect a lot of our self-funded plans. We're going to talk about the pros and cons of this, but with no further ado, here's Brady. Thanks, Adam. So just as you mentioned uh, earlier on, I, I want to get, just get two quick housekeeping items out that literally there was not enough time to make a slide for these two news items, but they're very, very important. And Adam mentioned before, yeah, the news just broke this morning about these three titans in our in our country, frankly, Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, and J.P. Morgan Chase. So what their their idea is to provide or their mission sounds a lot like ours in our industries, which is to cut health costs and improve services for employees. And there's very few details on what kind of a company they're going to be forming. But um, our industry values disruption, right? We, we value innovation and, of course, cost containment. So you can bet when these three guys get involved, these three companies get involved, we, can, we should be watching what they do very closely, and we will. And I want to make one other point on this, which is that I think this is really showing the emergence of a trend in the healthcare industry, which is that the distinction between healthcare providers and healthcare insur insurers is really being blurred. Think of the CVS Aetna merger. Um, what we're seeing here is really we have companies that just are taking it upon themselves to address costs because, frankly, the government's doing a poor job at doing that. And so we should expect more mergers and more big players to get involved in the industry. And like Adam said, it could either be very good for us or very bad for us. But either way, it's a disruptor, and we'll be watching to see what happens um, as more details come out with regard to their company. It seems like health insurance just stays in the news, huh? Yeah. It does, yeah. It's just staying in the news. We are so sexy. <laughs> <laughs> the best industry to be part of. I don't Broad know and sexy, the same sense. I don't know why we have to promote it. People should be knocking down the door. Speaking of sexy, so another uh, important item that happened this week, uh, actually just yesterday, was the swearing in of the new HHS Secretary, Alex Azar. We last mentioned him in our webinar in November when he was uh, nominated by President Trump, but he was um, appointed and approved yesterday, and confirmed yesterday, rather. So he was a former executive at Eli Lilly, which is a drug company, which was accused of price gouging. However, the president has said that he expects drug prices to, quote, come rocketing down now that we have the new Secretary of HHS. So, um, We'll see what he does with regards to that. But one important note here is that there were many executive orders that were being planned to be released that would impact the ACA, potentially Medicare, Medicaid, um, pharmaceutical industry, that were all placed on hold until this individual was confirmed. Now that he's been confirmed literally as of yesterday, we're going to expect a number of executive orders to drop. So uh, this is going to be a very big month for us and for our, our industry with regard to you know enforcement of the ACA and other um, policies which impact employer insurance, individual insurance, and we should expect to see them going forward. But one encouraging note um, is that in the president's speech yesterday during the confirmation of Mr. Azar, he did know that other countries are paying a fraction of a cost of what we pay uh, for the same drugs, and he sees it as a problem. The, there is an executive order that was drafted to tackle this problem, which we expect will now come out now that we have a leader at HHS. But uh, it's an important job. This department is a trillion dollar budget, 79,000 employees, and it oversees enforcement of the ACA and Medicare and Medicaid, so we'll watch it. So, okay, with those two things out of the way, we'll talk about what's happening to Obamacare, which is really uh, a, a pinprick by pinprick. It's being deflated. And we have talked about at length already the, the news uh, at the end of, end of the individual mandate and what that means for the impact potentially on our industry and, and you know, the threat to losing your healthy lives out of your risk pools. But also note that, and we mentioned this, that the, the actual end of the mandate isn't happening until 2019. However, there's action being taken in the meantime to expand the hardship exemptions that you can qualify for in 2018, which means that effectively you don't really need as an individual to worry about having health care coverage at the federal level, at least, for this year. That's being done because of the midterms in the fall, and the Republicans want to go out and say, hey, look, we repealed this unpopular mandate. Fifty-five percent of the public support any of the mandate, according to Kaiser. That's a huge number. And so, you know, the reasons before had to be pretty strict about why you didn't need to have coverage. Now they're going to be relaxed. That's one thing. Um, we also want to mention that, and we talked about this before, and, and Jen has an article on this point about the expansion of association health plans. This is a very popular um, uh, term and action taken by the administration because what it does is really it's targeted toward the middle class, or sort of Trump supporters, or people who who work for employers who were not subject to the employer mandate. You know, before you had you got together in associations and offered health plans, the primary purpose of your association, though, could not be to offer health insurance. Now, with the loosening of the regulations, you can have multiple employers who are disassociated get together just for the purpose of offering health insurance, and they can offer insurance that way. So it's really going to be, and also fewer ACA regulations will apply to those plans. So it's going to be popular. They're still ironing out the details on what exactly the requirements will be with these AHPs. 
Um, but we'll be watching it closely as that goes along. If you're a TPA or a broker listening right now and you want to be able to bring some of this information over to your clientele, feel free to reach out to us. We can help you put together a newsletter or an email or some memo that you can share with your clients so that you can be, you know, you can show them that you're on the forefront of what's going to happen this year and the, the, the coming years as well. So absolutely, feel yeah. free to take advantage and use Brady as you need to. So a couple other uh, pinpricks we've seen to the ACA, which is we talked about previously about the end of the, the federal reimbursements to insurers who provide coverage to low-income customers. They're shrinking the annual enrollment period for the ACA exchanges, cutting back the advertising budget. All these things combined with my, my last point here is expanding the rule regarding contraceptive coverage. We talked about the, the moral exemption that they're now offering to employers, which is, by the way, facing um, a roadblock in two district courts now. So at the moment, that policy has not been repealed, um, but we expect there to be a challenge on that front. And I also want to note recently, uh, I think last week, another HHS proposal was, was released, which would protect providers who have a moral or religious objection to treating certain patients. That's a pretty big deal, and we expect that to be challenged in the courts as well. But not just at the federal level, we have also a rollback of the ACA at the state level. And I'm not sure what's in the water right now in Idaho, but really, they've gone out on a limb here. They're way out front of it. Would be possible because FIA has an actual it office in be. Boise. It may be so that having an effect on them because we obviously have no effect on what's going on here in Massachusetts. <laughs> Clearly not. Maybe we are having some effect in Boise. But something in Boise is going on because the governor of Idaho uh, just last week announced that they're going to allow health plans to be sold in their state, which basically do not conform to the ACA. So literally no Obamacare needed. And the Department of Insurance is going to allow this. Um, and if you think about the big parts of the ACA that matter, uh, for example, pre-existing conditions and covering essential health benefits, that's a big deal. And so other states are taking note of this and are watching, are watching <clears throat> what Idaho is doing, because if this is permitted, then you can bet that other states are going to start offering kind of skimpy or skinny plans. So this is going back to the whole idea of skinny plans again. Remember that term? Sure. Yep. Uh -huh. right, we, have those, we had all those skinny plans that came out a couple years back. Those were the days. So and, and this you're saying is a plan could, you could have a health plan that says, all right, someone that has cancer, we're not going to cover you under the plan. Right. Someone that, there is no such thing as an essential health benefit. So you're going back in time to pre-Obamacare and those types of plans. But obviously there are people who like those benefits definitely yeah so that could be again especially in a, a workforce right now we're obviously unemployment that are low you know one of the big things about employee benefit plans is that's how you got people to actually want to work for your organization right, right. so i yeah. would think that for example at fia if i'm trying to get people to work here instead of some other brokerage brokerage house me going to them hey guess what we're going to offer you this horrible plan where we can deny you for pre the conditions and not offer you such a health benefits even though they have that at their blue cross plan right you know, I can see that as something that would not be something that would work here at this organization. But there are other companies out there that, you know, this would be a way for them to lower the overall yeah, cost. Yeah, it's a combination of two things, Adam. It's a buyer's market, like you say. And also, because of the elimination of the individual mandate, I think these plans and carriers and sponsors are scrambling to find ways to offer a product to the low-risk lives who are not looking to spend a lot on their health insurance. That's right. right. But, but you guys remember, these used to exist before ACA. They were called right. mini-med plans. Sure. This is not a right. new concept. This is something that previously existed, but was only available or useful for a particular market. Right. It's not new, but it's certainly bold. And again, I'm not sure what's in the water there, but maybe they could send some our way to Massachusetts. But speaking of Massachusetts and other blue states, it is also the case that while this is all happening, these rollbacks, we are seeing blue states fighting back. And we've mentioned some of this before, so I won't bore you with all the details. But just remember that, again, the states are taking note of the end of the individual mandate, and they're enacting their own in many cases because they recognize that it could be expensive for them otherwise. Hey, we're getting a bunch of questions about who to send uh, questions to about all the stuff that we're talking about. Feel free to reach out to Brady. You guys all have his contact information as well, but Brady will be the person to talk to in regards to getting information that you can send over to your clients and prospects. Thanks, Adam. So, so just to button this, this slide up here, just take note of the other states that are taking actions. And one I want to mention in particular is the creative plan by Maryland. I mentioned this in the, on the tax bill webinar we had, too, where they're basically saying, you know, we'll have a penalty if you don't have coverage, but we'll use it as a down payment for you to get coverage. So states are, are stepping up here, including D.C., because they want to protect their bottom line because if people don't have coverage, they might find themselves on the state Medicaid programs, and that's going to blow up their budget. And finally, the Colorado ballot measure, which is supposed to happen in this November, uh, we'll be watching to see if it actually does, but would require 
hospitals and providers that are supposed to charge masters, well, we'd love to see those documents. So if that happens at the state <laughs> level in Colorado, again, other states will take note and probably try to pass them. Well, as many of you know, we deal with a lot of balance bill issues here, and Colorado has their own state statutes, basically allowing them to bill patients for full bill charges. And we've looked into that particular statute recently, and there is no requirement that the charges be reasonable when they bill them. So right now, they have on the books if you have the plan pays the Medicare at 150% and there's still a balance of $5,000, they can balance bill the patient and without having to prove that what they're charging is reasonable in the first place. So this would be the total opposite of that, right? Yeah. Now they have to actually show their books on how they came up with those charges. So right. I think it's interesting that it came out in Colorado, especially when it's a state that gives facilities the right to balance bill patients in the first place. Yeah. And one final point in all these slides is that, again, the, the theme here is that Costs are out of control, and people are frustrated with a lack of response at the federal level and the state level. So people are acting on their own, and you're seeing proposals come up from different states trying new things, and thankfully, we're at the forefront of that in our industry. So as you guys all know, we're doing our podcast every week. We will have more information on what's going on in D.C. Brady is part of our show on a weekly basis, so thanks, Brady, for that insight. Jen, what are the most frequently asked questions that we've seen this month and in December of 2017? If we could spend a couple minutes on this, that'd be fabulous. All right, I will be quick. Number one, is basing employee contributions off of salary considered discriminatory? Answer, it depends. However, it is not discriminatory based on a health factor if that contribution is tied only to the salary and not specifically to the health factor. But always be mindful of the 105H non-discrimination rules because sometimes a higher salary means a higher contribution. And if you're treating that individual differently, it could run afoul of the highly compensated individual 105H testing. Two, what types of claims are eligible for independent external IRO review? Do we have to abide by every single request? So the answer to this is going to be it potentially is going to depend, obviously because a claim could be denied in part for a medical necessity reason, but denied in part for a reason that would not be eligible for an IRO review. So you're gonna to have to take a look at each claim and the basis for the denial of that claim on a piece by piece basis to make sure that you understand which part of the claim may or may not be eligible for an external review. Part two, uh, do states, or I guess- hey, Hold on, before you, before you get there. Yep. In regards to that second question, so as you all know, we have our pay service where we take over the fiduciary responsibility from plans on final level appeals. So we have a lot of experience with this, but to give you a high level question without, you know, with a little bit of an asterisk there at the end, clinical reviews are eligible for IROs typically, whereas legal reviews aren't. But again, you have to look at each question because some of the medical necessity stuff has a legal piece to it and a clinical piece to it. Right. So we've seen this. Uh, just looking at our reviews, it's about a 60-40 split legal versus clinical is what we see. So just take that as a high-level answer. But again, that's why you need to reach out to PGC Referral FE Group to find out in your particular situation right. what the right answer is. There could be multiple parts of a claim. So a strict yes or a strict no may not always be the case. All right, question three, does state prompt pay rules apply to ERISA plans? And the answer to this is generally no, they don't apply to an ERISA plan since they are state prompt pay laws, but there could be a circumstance where these rules could apply to the administrator or the TPA. So it's, you need to be careful and review all of the different state prompt pay laws on a case-by-case -case basis to see what may have an impact on the particular TPA and the plan. And last but not least, does ERISA have its own prompt pay requirements? And the answer to this is no. <laughs> there are no prompt pay requirements under ERISA at this time. Right, so prompt pay, a lot of the prompt pay rules come from just the network contracts themselves. Networks. And what they say, and then some states obviously require them, like in Texas and others that we've seen. But, you know, it's not something you're going to find in ERISA. That's good news, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm thinking, I'm thinking Idaho is looking to pass a prompt pay law for like two to three years. It's like, hey, when you get around to it, it's all good. Yeah. All right, Jen, let's talk about the flagship and what it is and why we came up with that great name instead of best practices. So this all started a few years ago when individuals were asking us, as we're going through the plan drafting process, there are a lot of variables with a lot of customization. That's one of the reasons we've always said why people wanted to have a self-funded plan because they were really intrigued about the opportunity to control their own destiny. 
they wanted to not pick a gold, bronze, silver, platinum, diamond plan. Instead, they wanted to pick a benefit structure that was uniquely tailored to the actual participants and employees at that group. So we started offering all of these customized options and do you want to cover this? Do you want to exclude this? Do you want to have non-Duke COB or do you want to have standard COB? What are the options that are going to make the most sense for your population? So we asked and created all of this customized provisions. And then as we were going through this process with some of these newer groups, those who had not been self-funded before, they didn't necessarily appreciate all the options that have become available to them. Well, let's let be honest. I mean, when you say they didn't appreciate, if you've never been self-funded before, you were never told that you had options before. Right. So as more and more of these plans are coming into the self-funded world, whether it's as a, as a level-funded plan or a captive type plan, or you're a TPA with a couple of new groups. The idea that you can go to a group with 200 employees who's always been fully insured, and all of a sudden now you're going, can you, here's 25 different workers' comp exclusions. Pick which one you like the best. Sounds overwhelming. Right. That is where, you know, the best, what is the best practice came to light. And this is something right. that Jen brought to our attention saying that not every group is as sophisticated. Maybe when a group is self-funded for three or four years, it right. does make sense to give them more options. That's but right, right now, this is their intro to self-funding. It's self-funding a one-on-one. Right. What is the best language to have? Right. Tell them what it is, get them to sign off right. on it, and move on. In general, a lot of these employers are not in the business of offering health insurance. They sell jeans. They sell... Right. Necklaces, they sell you know, clothes. I was going to say, somebody was ready to Jeans, shopping, necklaces, yeah, yeah. are you ready to go? Are you going to shopping at lunch? <laughs> yeah. But the point is, that wasn't what their main focus was. They wanted somebody else to tell them, based on your experience, based on the other plan options that you've seen, what is the industry standard and what is going to best protect me? So what we did in combination, what we have offered to our employees here at FIA, which is what we like to consider our best practices, we have replicated that process to do multiple things. One, to put all of our best practices in place, and two, and arguably more important, to make the drafting process even easier. So it was born the best practices, aka flagship template. So basically what we're saying to you is if you're new to self-funding or if you're a TPA or a broker who's selling self-funded plans, level-funded plans are perfect for this. Any captive group is perfect for this. What it includes is if you ask, if you put a gun to Ron's head and said, we want the best plan dog rated. We, had a t we basically took the FIA group's own self-funded plan template, reproduced it for the masses. So if you want PACE, it's there. If you want the incentive plans for the employees, it's there. It picks our best definitions. But this is where we're saying our major template on PDM, our plan dog manager software, has all the options, has all the bells, bells and whistles. But if you want to limit some of those whistles, mm -hmm. limit some of those bells, and just have us choose which one's the best, the flagship obviously would be for you. Yeah, I like that you bring up captives and, and uh, level funded also because there's two reasons why I think the flagship is well tailored for that. One being that, like you said, uh, the self-funded employer who is sort of dipping their toe into self-funding for the first time, they may be the ideal audience for a captive or for a level funded plan. But secondly, um, in those types of infrastructures, you need some consistency in the language. You need that there are no gaps between the policy and the plan or between the different groups that form the captive. When everybody signed up for the same flagship, you decrease the variables, which means you decrease the opportunity for variance between the plans. Now, Jen, on this one, I know you're asking people to raise their hands. You realize that we can't actually see their hands. I, I can, so I don't know I if the you, camera was working. Can there maybe <laughs> we can have people just comment on it? But you want to just give them a, a yeah, choice. So the point here is that there are a lot of things that you don't know what you don't know. So when you are provided with a checklist for drafting and creating a plan, maybe you're provided with multiple options and you can't tell the difference. And we know we actually recently this came up at FIA that not only is there a potential subtle difference between the words. But comma placement can have a potential impact on how that term is supposed to be interpreted. Maybe there's a provision and they seem like all great choices, but you don't know which would be the best option for your particular group because you don't know what each option means. Or maybe you're just looking for an opportunity for someone to say, guys, these all look great, but can you tell me based on your best practices and your judgment, what's the best choice for me? So Jen, instead of talking about it, let's show them. So give them an example of what Right now, using our template, using our PDM template, and what you see out there in the industry, this is what? So what are we looking at right now in this This screen? is our workers' compensation exclusion options. And this is just part of it because we couldn't even put all of them on the screen. 
there are so many choices. I think there's about 10 more than this. Yep, there's a ton. There's a difference between the words may, required, may be eligible, has waived. There are so many different nuanced differences between each of these work comp exclusions. It's hard to tell. All right, so stop here. Don't move the slide. Folks on the call, if you are a TPA or a broker, every one of these has a different, at the end of the day, based on which one you're choosing, on, on the first one, you might pay. On the second one, you might deny that claim. Same claim. Depending on which one you pick, one is paid, one is denied. One may be denied by stop loss or one may be paid by the stop loss carrier. So under flagship, what's the option? Our best practices. That's it. It's one a vision. <laughs> That's the wow. vision. So there are no choices. All of the guesswork has been taken out of putting together what exclusions are going to be relevant because we have already done that for you. And surprise, this work cop exclusion will mirror most of the plan document provisions that we have seen. So this is a real opportunity to make this drafting process much easier and also take advantage of the options that FIA thinks would probably be the best interest for the plan. Now, we've got a couple comments related to flagship. A couple of things real quick. Uh, some people asked about what if, you know, charge masters and access. Feel free to reach out to us on that. Anytime you want, you have all emails. Second thing was some carriers would allow for a customized plan doc for their level funded product. I would tend to disagree. What you can do is look at what they have right now. There are a lot of different level funded plans. We know right now, Ron did some research on this, what, over 30? Yeah. That yeah, yeah. so we have seen over 30 different carriers or organizations that are offering level funded products, right. all with different plan designs. So we think there are opportunities out there, and obviously with people that just say they love the flagship, we say thank you to you. But this language, for example, is pretty simple. You have this language, your claims examiner can't screw up whether or not a claim is payable, and you don't have shock value for a stop loss carrier or MGU telling you why they can't reimburse you on a particular claim. Sounds like a win-win. So good. Next one. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I'm... So I'm, wait, I'm, of I'm, course Ron does I'm, I guess the <laughs> Variable within variable. As long as we're not talking about assignment of benefits, I'm fine. Oh, man. Ron, you what know, you got here? You get one tattoo across your back that says AOB, and next thing you know, you're always the assignment of benefits. Guys, guy. he actually has an assignment of benefits tattoo. Uh, so, speaking of uh, variables within variables, you know, um, it's interesting the reason why uh, I'm, I'm so excited to talk about uh, these two exclusions <laughs> and a legal act. The illegal act exclusion was actually the origin of our gap review. People don't realize, you know, we talk about mind the gap and the gap between the plan and the stop loss policy. People don't realize the first ever gap case that we dealt with had to do with an illegal act scenario where the plan language indicated they were going to deny claims arising from a felony only and the stop loss policy denied claims arising from all illegal acts. They had a plan member who was driving under the influence of alcohol. It was the first offense, so it was a misdemeanor and not a felony. Therefore, based on the plan language, they had to pay. But the stop loss, like I said, said all legal acts, which this was. Misdemeanors are illegal, in case you know, you're looking for some criminal wow. legal uh, advice. Brady, <laughs> sorry to blow your mind there. And as a result, stop loss was allowed to deny it. And that brought to mind the need for a gap review. And at the time, we started comparing language and closing gaps. But what we didn't really consider was how the differences, the subtle differences in language like you see here, not only impact uh, the, the plan itself and how you're going to pay or deny claims, but Adam, like you said, it may also result in a payment or a denial by stop loss. All right, so what's the difference? Sure. So when you look, for instance, at causation, causation is one of the big issues as well. Um, where you're talking about if the illegal act actually caused it or rather was it uh, occurring during the commission. Uh, causation also is important when you look at, uh, there's actually case law now, where if you don't explicitly state that uh, the incident, the illegal act had to cause the injury, then it's assumed that it, the causation is a requirement and therefore it's right, so, injured during the legal act. And I, and I apologize for this. Folks, I apologize. Ron is an attorney. He you asked that, for it. You asked like for it. like to talk in legal terms. So let's do it in a layman term, okay, for all my friends in Dorchester to understand. So if I'm driving drunk, shame on you, and I'm driving down the road, okay, and instead of me crashing, knock on wood, instead of me crashing into a stop sign, hurting nobody by myself, a rock falls from the sky and lands on the car. That rock is landing on my car and hurting me regardless sober, if I was drinking or not. Sober or drunk the causation. There are some plans that would still have to pay my claim because my injuries were not 
due to being drunk. Right. right. They were due to a rock falling from the sky. During the commission versus caused by the commission. That is a big difference. So people said legal versus clinical. This goes right down to it. That is a legal review that you would have to do and potentially a clinical review because unless maybe a doctor can prove that if I was as drunk, my issues wouldn't be as severe. So that is why this is very, very important. And it's just one of the many things that come up in this exclusion. And it's amazing if you think about it, we're having a whole conversation about one exclusion. How many exclusions are in the plan document? So if you look at the flagship, we picked the provision that we thought covered all the bases. What's really, really important uh, here also is to talk about the issue of causation, not only uh, as far as whether the incident was caused by the illegal act, but also whether charges are necessary, uh, criminal charges. I'll give you a quick story and then we'll move on. You know, often what you'll have is somebody who, if they're injured during the commission of an illegal act, what do they do? They have a defense attorney, right? Right? They were injured during commission of illegal acts, so chances are they have a defense attorney they're dealing with the criminal, criminal charges. That defense attorney, during his spare time, pro bono, is also going to try and get the claims paid. And what does that attorney say? That attorney says, well, my client's charges were dismissed, or, or we, uh, we pled down, and, and you know, they're, they're getting a slap on the wrist. So because they weren't convicted for the criminal charges, you can't use the criminal act as a basis for the exclusion. That's nonsense. And the example we like to use, everybody remembers the O.J. Simpson case. He was found not guilty in a criminal trial, and yet he was found liable in a civil trial because the standard of review is different. And I'm telling you right now, if your plan language is clear and you have the right to administer it, it doesn't matter if criminal charges end up filing through as long as there's evidence of an illegal act. Now, I'm assuming people are going to get access to all these slides right after this is over. So, yes, we are giving you for free our actual language wow. to put into your plan. What a way to start the year. What I would advise you is that roughly 70%, 70% of the plan documents that we review have the wrong or confusing or contradicting illegal acts language in their plan documents. It should be illegal. 75% of the plan documents that we get have that problem. You're well. So feel free to take this, use it in your illegal acts provision, and take a look at what you have currently and see what the differences may be in different plan documents. Grab five, have one of your assistants that work there, an intern at your company, take 10 of your plan docs, find the illegal acts provision in all 10, and I guarantee you, you'll have three or four different variables or differences in regards. So, but just remember, when you're adding all these provisions in your plan, make sure all of the terminology matches and don't just blindly put this into your document. I just can't help myself. Right, I just don't want to let people know that you're giving them something free. So here's a quote, instead of me reading the quote, you must get a new quote. So Adam, who cares? We don't care about all this. Here's the bottom line. We're sick of checklists. They take hours. We're sick of brokers and plans not being able to get back to us with all their changes. Um, I would say at least half of you, the plan right now, it's the end of January. You still don't have a plan doc for your plan, even though you've been paying claims on it since January 1, because you can't get that employer group or their broker to sign off. We get it. Here's the bottom line. We knew that no one would buy the flagship unless we could cut the amount of time it took to actually complete a checklist by more than half. I told Jen we have to cut it by 75%. She laughed at me. And guess what? That is exactly what we did. So Jen, how long does it take to do a normal checklist? If the employee group is sitting in front of you and ready to answer all the questions, right. how long does it take to do a normal plan doc, roughly? Yeah, so it'll take about two hours. If you're going through the process of answering every single question, grandfathered, non-grandfathered, eligibility, benefits that are appropriate, exclusions to add, who the COBRA contact is going to be. There are a lot of questions that need to be addressed and answered, and it takes about two hours to go through that process when you're fully focused and going through it together. So what's it take now on the flagship? If you're going through this with the flagship, we have eliminated the majority of the questions, so it only should take about a half an hour if you are focused and can go through this document. You can get it done over your lunch break. All you need to do is be focused and answer the questions that are asked. Now, before we get into the uh, actual demo, which we're going to have a little bit of time on, Talk about some of the different variables here. Yes. So when we're going through and creating the actual flagship template, one of the things that was most important to us is that we were actually going to be taking control of what things needed to be the most, the most important for having a planned document. And we didn't want to eliminate those options. We still wanted that to be relevant for the employer to decide upon. So the key things when you're actually creating a document that we have not taken the guesswork out of that are still part of the decision that the employer is going to have to make is eligibility. 
So there are different requirements for whether you have to work 30 hours per week, 25 hours per week, 40 hours per week, or whether or not you cover retirees or whether or not your dependent spouses are covered. So there are a lot of eligibility criteria uh, questions that are still going to be relevant for us to consider when we are drafting the plan. And those are still questions that you'll have to address. The next is the leave of absence provisions in addition to the coordination or the continuation of coverage provisions. So there are differences from one employer's handbook to the next employer's handbook. So if you have a leave of absence provision where you're allowing continuation of coverage only for FMLA, but you're not necessarily allowing continuation of coverage for sick leave, that needs to be outlined within the plan document. So we're offering you that opportunity to customize your own leave of absence provisions within the continuation of coverage section on your own. And whether or not you want to have one level of appeal versus two level of appeals, that's also something that you should be uh, addressing. But we have added into our document, I do think this is important. Um, one of the things we have done at SIA has gone out of our way to offer employees the opportunity to have their own incentives. We want them to have some sort of accountability. They need to be uh, clear on the decisions that they're making and how it impacts our plan as a whole. So all of those great opportunities and incentives that are offered in FIA plans are now part of our flagship. So if you read the Boston Globe article about the FIA group's plan, if you've seen any of our recent presentations at conferences on LinkedIn or on social media, you'll notice all those employee incentive ideas that we have at FIA are available to you. You don't have to use them. You might think they're too generous, but they're there as part of the flagship template as well as PACE and our FIA Unwrapped product, which as you know, replaces or gives you an option on a claim-by-claim -claim basis to replace RAP networks on certain claims and have those paid based on a reference-based price or some other claim charge parameters. So Ron, I know you want to talk a little bit as well in regards to some of the uh, our overall goals of what we're trying sure. to accomplish. So I feel it very important to to speak out. You know, as we talk about eliminating options, eliminating options, eliminating options, it makes it sound almost as if we're promoting a cookie cutter uh, uh, method or means for providing plan document services. And years ago, we spoke out against the cookie cutter approach. Uh, in fact, our our initial foray into plan documents originated because somebody else was producing plan documents using a cookie cutter approach. Those clients would finalize their plan document. I'm doing air quotes, you can't see. <laughs> Send us those final, again, air quote, plan documents, and we would go in and actually update and change and quote unquote redline those documents. I wanna make it absolutely clear to everybody who's listening right now. The flagship is the most effective and what I think is the best way to produce a foundational plan. But there is nothing stopping you from working with us and revising and editing and customizing that document. The Word document, Microsoft Word, editable, redline uh format is, is still something that's available. So don't assume that you're locked in with this language. So you still have the variables, but we get it. We just focus on the variables that we think are most important to, the, to creating a cost effective self-funded plan. But what we didn't bring up yet, stop loss. We have had stop loss carriers review this particular template. We got their feedback, we made changes. So feel free if you're being lasered, if you have a exclusion, if there is a gap between your flagship plan doc and a stop loss policy, many of these stop loss policy carry, many of these stop loss carriers after reviewing the flagship will mirror your plan from a stop loss perspective. I think that's important to bring up. All right, Jen, we got about 10 minutes to actually do a, uh, a demo of what the flagship looks like. I hope that we don't have any problems here in this regard on this live demo. But obviously, if anyone is looking to have a more in-depth demo, feel free to contact Jen McCormick on this. Last thing I want to bring up before we do it, though, I had a great question. The incentives, are they in the plan doc or are they in the employee handbook? It depends. Hmm. Some of our incentives are outlined within the plan. Some of our outlines outlined within the employee handbook. Some of the incentives are just put into the plan doc in general terms without details. And more details are outlined within the terms of the employee handbook. Those are questions you can feel free to reach out to us based on your specific plan need and also the type of network arrangement you may have for your current claims process. So, Jen? All right, I won't take up too much time, but I do want to make sure that we have the opportunity to go through some of the key features and interfaces of how the flagship is going to work. So 
we have already logged into the flagship template and we have already created a kind of a sample. This is going to be the login screen here that's going to give you the opportunity to see what it is that active documents that you're still working on and the checklist that you have, it tells you the last updated date. So um, that's going to be an important login screen for you. The next questions that you're going to have to go through once you've created the checklist is answering questions, key, key questions about your actual plan, name of employer, name of the plan, whether you use PACE, whether there's a plan administrator and that's, that's separate from the plan sponsor. So there's a lot of questions that are just basic information questions that would be in any plan document, your plan year, your effective date. So you'll go through those questions and you'll need to answer those. It's pretty cool at the top because you can see that there's different ways that you can navigate through the system. So if you wanted to do a keyword search, you can click the search button. And so search what does that mean, Jeff? Yeah, is that search? What so is, what if that I mean? click on the search button, it'll pull up a little text box and I can type in preventive and it will take me to any questions that relate to the word preventive. So it's like a Google search within PDM. Ooh. Pretty exciting. Very exciting. <laughs> the next option right here is view all answers. So if I wanted to take the 30 minutes of work of all of the questions that I've answered, I want to take this to the group. I want the I want the group to be uh, aware of everything that I have added and make sure they can sign off on that. I can download a copy of my actual checklist questions and the answers so that would be available for anyone who maybe not be. I don't want to say not tech savvy, but maybe they prefer a tangible version of the checklist questions and answers. Uh, the next button is the complete checklist button. And this is going to allow you to lock your document in place. So once you've gone through the process, and you've answered all the questions, this is your version control. So you can make sure there aren't unsolicited changes that have not necessarily been approved. You can complete checklist and lock it. The next is to duplicate your checklist. So if you are looking for how you can create a 2018 to 2019 document, because we're really excited about next year, you can take your existing checklist and do a save as of that and make only the changes that might be relevant for the plan, like maybe the effective date. So give me an example. Like, so if, a, if I have a plan that in 2017 has already used checklist, used our checklist, I could duplicate it for 2018, but if there were any changes made to the schedule of benefits, for example, or an address, Mm -hmm. I could duplicate it and just make small minor changes, which will save even more time. Right. So I only have to make the changes that are relevant if I'm trying to restate my doc. Uh, the last is the view document. So this is going to give me my preview of the actual document that I created so that I can see all of the choices that I have made. Also, as you're going through the actual questions, it's pretty cool because you can post comments, flag questions, and view your actual comments. Yeah. So the post comment is where you're posting a comment to say, name of employer is the FIA group. But I think that I should add comma LLC here. You click here. on that so we can see what you mean. Yep. All right. So basically, if I was writing this, if I was a, if I was a examiner or if I was a uh, account manager, and I said, "Hey, plan isn't sure exact wording of what right. their name is." These where you can just put any comment or flag things. Can post my comment, and I'll actually show you how it works too. Cool. Okay. So it says add comma LLC. It says that it was posted by the flagship. Schedule benefits on uh, today's date at 13:49 p.m. Got it. So, and it also can allow me to edit this comment too. So, if I want to say, "Just kidding," add a different title or don't make that modification, I can actually edit my comment too and build my chronology so I have my version control. What does flag mean? The flag is if you're going through these questions and you're unsure of what it is that I should be answering or how the question is going to work, I can flag it. So that I'll know that this is all of a sudden red. Uh oh, urgency! I need to come back to this question, otherwise answer it. So you can flag all the questions that you aren't clear of at the time and come back to it later on. But the neat thing about the flagging and the posting comments is that you can run reports in PDM. So if you want to have, if you've gone through, it's taken 30 minutes to go through the actual uh, flagship template. You've answered all the questions, but there's still one thing that you're unclear of. Say you still need the tax ID number, and only the group has it. So you can flag that one question. You can ask us to run a report for you and provide that one outstanding question in a report to the actual group, and they can get that answered, and then voila, you have your completed document. So the thing at the top here with these three blue lines, this is the table of contents. So if you click on this, it's going to show you all of the different categories that you can click from one section to the next. Yep. So this is showing me all of the different options. So within this document, I can so go. So within the flagship, these are all the different sections, and people obviously can go through each one of these. And can you show us how that looks? Yep. So 
there at the top here. So if I wanted to go to the exclusion section, you only have one choice. And that one choice is whether or not you want to have an exclusion for foreign travel. And you might say, well, why, only, why are you asking me? That's the only exclusion. That's the only choice. And I'm asking you that because you might have a program in place where you go abroad and for the, the purposes right, of Right, you might go to the Cayman Islands, for example. Right, so we don't want that exclusion to be applicable. But no. if you wanted to say, what is that actual language? I scroll over this hint, and it tells me exactly the language that's going to appear in the document. So basically, the hint is telling you this is what it's going to say if you put it in there. So we have this type of hint on a lot of our questions, correct? Yep. And then it says here, ask the, ask the group, meaning you would go back to the group because you're not sure. Right, so the, really, the cool thing about that button, too, is so I say excluded. I add it to the document as an exclusion. I say silent. It's not added to the document. I say ask the group. It gets added to the draft in green font. So you know that this is something when you're scrolling through this document with the group, you can see what the language looks like, but it's in a different color font, so you can see exactly what the group needs to decide upon. Okay, two questions I have in regards to this. One, in a normal PDF template, I put a gun to ad. How many exclusion questions are there? There are about 20, I think. So we went from 20 to 1. Right. And secondly, in regards, how many overall, how many actual TPAs use the flagship and or our PDM template software anyway, so that people don't think this is like some brand new thing that we're doing, and how many years have we been doing it? So we've been working on the this for about six years or so, seven years, I believe, and we have about 50 or so different TPAs, and more than that, um, brokers and other entities and plans that are actually using it on an independent basis. So a lot of people are using this. And in addition to the FIA stuff, there's other opportunities for how you can create. So just documents. so I know, from Plan Doc Management, this is not, so we have a flagship option. You have your normal PPO option. You have your PPO with out of network at reference-based pricing. You have your reference-based pricing plan where all claims are paid at reference-based pricing. You have reference-based pricing templates where in-network physician, physician claims are paid on an in-network basis. Right. I mean, there's every plan design that you could possibly think of basically tied into some type of template, correct? Yeah. And why is that? Why does that happen? Is it because so many TPAs just have so many different types of plans and we have to build that for them? So we have tried to accommodate the options that people have asked for. So if there is a group that only wants to have, uh, if we only have a group that wants to have maybe SBCs, there's a template for SBCs. If there's a group that only wants to have a cost control or they only reprice claims out of network, so we have that option built in there. So it's really built for us to uh, guess for what the type of options people are looking for. So instead of having to customize everything, it's already been customized for you. All you need to do is press the button. I know, listen, I have to give a shout out. Joni Berger, please stop texting us. <laughs> she has sent 40 texts. I think she's waiting for us to actually say her name. Yes, hi Joni, we know you're there. You've been there since 2011. <laughs> and yes, they've been using PDM since 2011. They were the first TPA, GPA was to actually use this. They helped us build it. So yeah. thank you, Joni for helping to be part of uh, where think, we are now. I think we need to take a screenshot, actually. The uh, Jen and PDM rocks. I think you're never going to see that again. So let's take Aww. a screenshot. Anything else you want to show us, Jen? We're running out of time. Any last things you want to show us? No, this is the medical section. Um, so there's the different questions you go through. One of the uh, things, benefits. So one of the things that we have added that everyone is going to, everyone who's a CA user is going to have the opportunity to provide feedback on whether they like, hate, ambivalent about is the creation of a schedule of benefits within the plan document yourself. So you can go through whether benefit by benefit, you can say what for allergy services, what the copay is, what the copay is, what the coinsurance is, whether there's no charge, you can answer all of these awesome questions and then it's going to populate, I have to go slow so they can see okay. it. So that everyone can populate all of these questions and it'll populate a Word document version of your schedule of benefits grid. So you can make, as Ron said earlier, in like 4,000 words, you can put this in a Word doc. There you go. Customize Perfect. It. That's, That's it. Nice job. Uh, That's quick it. question. Is there an assignment of benefits section? In this? <laughs> there oh, is. Boy. Nice. There is. I like there it. Is. All right, guys. Thank you so much for the hundreds of you that have joined us. Really quick, let you know, our next webinar is going to be on February 22nd, 2018 at 1 o'clock. We're going to do a lot of fun stuff. We are going to take your RAP network contracts and we're going to rip them apart. Unlike your normal TP, under like your normal Buka Blue PPO network, where you can't choose to go in and out in regards to how you pay claims, we're going to tell you what provisions, what sections allow you to decide, I don't want to pay this with a RAP network. I want to negotiate this claim on my own. 
if you are an NGU, a stop loss carrier, or if you are anyone that's just sick of paying high claims at ridiculous amounts, high charges at a different at a ridiculous amounts, you need to tune into this one. I think John Jablon, who runs our who's director of our provider relations division, will be joining us for this webinar. On behalf of Jen McCormick, Brady Bizarro, Ron Peck, and myself, Adam Russo, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you and talk to you in a couple weeks. Thank you.